So it's a great time of year to think about all of the wonderful things that we have in our lives, mm -hmm. to think about Jesus Christ. And yes, we think about you know this time of year, uh, Jesus Christ being born, but also there is a lot that we have in life because Jesus Christ was born. Jesus Christ was born um, and now we have Holy Spirit in us because he was resurrected and he is with the Father. And with that Holy Spirit comes some really great things in our lives. We get this close personal relationship with God and we get uh, something that is called fruit of the Spirit. So it's kind of like this beautiful gift basket of fruit that you get when you're born again. Uh, and we have talked in the past about some of the different fruits of the Spirit and how these fruits grow in the lives of believers, right? That when you're a believer, you have all of these things available to you. So let's start just by taking a look at what they are. Turn to Galatians chapter five. And it really is a wonderful thing just to think about and reflect in your own mind and life, all that you have because of Christ, all that you have because of the Holy Spirit and all that that means to your life. We're gonna start in Galatians chapter five, pick it up in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So if we live in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, as we are walking out as believers, as we are doing the everyday things that we do for God and all that God asks us to do, we have these fruits of the Spirit that are available to us that we can utilize in our own personal lives. And something incredibly beautiful that I have noticed is that all of these fruits of the Spirit, they are all like interconnected. They work so beautifully mm -hmm. together in your life. I think that it would be extremely hard to be patient if you weren't loving, right? If you didn't have the fruit of the Spirit love, mm -hmm. it'd be very hard to be patient with people because it requires love sometimes to be patient in, in situations. And I think that if we didn't have patience, it would be very hard to be gentle and so on. You see how they work together, how these, they're all interconnected, how God so beautifully and masterfully designed all of the things that he has made available for us so that we can be our very best selves for God. And today I wanted to dig a little deeper into gentleness. It's maybe one of the fruits of the spirit that doesn't get as much um, attention. So I thought it would be great to really highlight that in the word of God for you guys today and to see how God sees gentleness, right? Um, I think gentleness is something that is often overlooked, um, undervalued, and maybe even a little bit diminished in people's minds. I'll give you an example, okay? So think of a timid old lady, right? And she's awfully sweet, but she falls just for every single scam that anyone comes up with. Oh no. And um, you know, she is maybe taken advantage of because of that. And she is someone you would call blissfully ignorant. And she just, she's not aware of too much. And people would say, she's such a gentle soul. Have you ever heard someone say something that she's just a gentle soul? And that's a really nice way of saying like, she just kind of floats through life without having any clue of what's going on. And so maybe when you hear that you're to be gentle, you think to yourself, oh, okay. So I need to be a little bit kind of unaware of everything that's happening in the world to be gentle. Maybe I need to be a little bit timid or pull myself back or dull myself down a little bit because that's what gentle is if that's your definition of it, if it's that timid lady, right? or man or whatever and yet that is not what god is asking us to be when he asks us to be gentle and in fact god does not want us to be dull in the word of god it talks about iron sharpening iron mm -hmm. and that that's something that god wants us to do for one another that you make each other be better that you're sharp that you are aware of all of the things so what is it that is this gentleness turn to second corinthians chapter 10. 
because God doesn't want us unaware for the sake of making or keeping peace. That is not God's way. God wants us to be knowledgeable. Um, and it's a great thing. It's a great thing to be sharp. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, this is Paul speaking, verse 1. He says, Now I, Paul, beseech you, I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence and base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. And I wanted to start with this verse um, because it talks about the meekness and the gentleness of Jesus Christ. And when I think of Jesus Christ, I do not think of timid or blissfully ignorant, right? I think of my bold Savior who knew the word of God front and back, right? I think of Jesus Christ who literally was tempted by Satan himself and he was able to back him off because he was so bold, because he was so knowledgeable, because he was in control of the situation. So when I think of gentle in terms of Jesus Christ and his gentleness, then I don't have to make myself less than, right? To be gentle. Jesus Christ, he was gentle. Turn to Matthew chapter 11. And in Matthew chapter 11, we'll see Jesus Christ himself talking. <coughs> Matthew 11, verse 28. This is Jesus talking. He says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So the word that's translated here as meek, when Jesus Christ says, I am meek and lowly in heart, that is our word. So this word, um, when you're reading through the fruits of the spirit in Galatians 5, the word um, gentleness comes from this word, um, I'm not going to say it right, but protes, protes. Um, and this word meek here in Matthew chapter 11 is the word pros. And they come from the same word. So pros is the adjective or the describing word of the noun, which is protes. So they go together. It is describing the actions of the noun. So when Jesus Christ says that he is meek, what he's saying is he's gentle. I'm going to read it to you from uh, a translation called the English Standard Version. It says, come to me. This is verse 28. All who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So if we are like Jesus Christ was gentle, right? The way he was kind to people, the way he was compassionate, the way he gave and did for them, the way he loved them, the way people were drawn to him, right? If we are gentle like Jesus Christ, it will lead to rest in our souls. And um, if we want to be imitators of Jesus Christ, which we do, which the word of God tells us to be, then we are to be gentle. It's, it's a really actually important thing. Um, and this is just a little side note for you guys. Today, I'm going to be reading a lot from different translations of the Bible. Uh, and it's a really great tool to know that you can utilize different translations of the Bible, especially to help you understand verses that you might have a harder time understanding in the King James English. And that's okay. Um, so I'm going to read from a lot of the English Standard Version, and that gives a word-for-word -word translation. Uh, so if you're looking at some of the critical Greek texts, for example, the word-for-word -word translation is what they base the English Standard Version off of. So it's a good, trustworthy version, um, and it's something that you can go to and feel confident in reading. So I just wanted you guys to know that because tonight a lot of what I'm reading here is going to be different than what's in your Bibles if you have the King James. So turn to Galatians chapter 6, and we'll look more into being gentle and what that means and how we can use, use that in our own life to bring that rest to our souls, to bring godly results. Galatians 6 verse 1, I'm going to read it in the English Standard Version. It says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, 
You who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. So we're looking at this verse here, right? And anyone who's caught in a transgression, that's anyone who's messing up, right? Anyone who's missing the mark, who's falling short. You who are spiritual, you who want to be a believer, you who know God's word, you can restore them, right? You can help them to get back to making good choices in a spirit of gentleness. Um, and that you can be aware of yourself as you do it, right? We're totally aware, even if we're gentle, um, that we too don't fall into the same traps. So gentleness leads to restoration. And I think that's really cool because when we are gentle, we are clear minded. All right. We're keeping our minds clear and focused and we're able to bring about godly results in a situation, desired results. Um, so gentleness is the attitude that we need when we're dealing with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Turn to Second Timothy chapter two. So we're seeing already that gentleness is it's an attitude. It's kind of a way of thinking clearly. It is um, restful to the person who's receiving it. It's restful to us. Second Timothy chapter two, verse 24. I'll read this in the King James. It says, and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. So the servant of the Lord, we're servants of the Lord. We must be gentle to all men. We must be gentle to all people, apt to teach. We're teaching them what is good, what is right. We're instructing them with that meekness, right? We're keeping ourselves humble. We're not puffed up. Um, those that oppose themselves and people who oppose themselves, they're just people who are doing things that aren't best for them. Things that are wrong, things that are going to not help them to do God's will. Mm. And we're going to help those people by being gentle. Um, the approach that we need when we're teaching people the truth and correcting error is gentleness. And gentleness is being aware of all of the things because you cannot correct something if you're not aware of what is the right thing to be doing in that situation. So it falls right in line with God wanting us to be knowledgeable, God wanting us to know his word, to know him. But it's a manner, the gentleness, um, in which we talk to someone where they are able to receive what we're saying. So I think about um, someone is doing something wrong here, right? They are opposing themselves. And I'm trying to tell them that what they're doing isn't God's best. And so if I walk up to them and get in their face and yell at them, you know better, you shouldn't be doing this. You know, I can't believe after all of whatever that this is how you're going to behave. Um, their walls are going to go right up. They're not going to receive anything that you say. And you've only made the situation worse because now there's a hurt between you and that person. Okay. But if you handle it with gentleness, if you're clear minded, if you're kind and loving and tender to them and you get them where their heart is a little bit tender too, well, now they can receive the things that you've said. Now, maybe they can change. Maybe God's heart for that situation can be done because of the approach that you've handled this situation. Turn to Ephesians chapter four. Ephesians chapter four, uh, we're gonna start in verse one. I'm gonna read this again from the English Standard Version. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, this is Paul talking, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing one another in love, eager, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So we have these fruits of the spirit so that we can walk in the spirit, right? Mm -hmm. So as we're doing that, it, we are told here to be gentle unto all men and patient, another fruit of the spirit, that um, long suffering is patience. Um, in meekness, another fruit of the spirit. Instructing those, oh no, I'm reading the wrong one. No, I'm going back. Well, also those things are true, but in this one too, um, we are called to be gentle and patient and bearing one another in love. So still those fruits of the spirit, they're working together. Um, and then we're, 
able to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. When we're walking in a manner that is worthy of what God has asked us to do, we are gentle. Um, and we see here that that brings about what God really wants. It's never about what we want or what our emotions are in that situation. When we're living for and serving God, it should always be what God wants. Not me, Lord, but what can I do for you? Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. It is really beautiful as you're going through these things to know what the fruits of the Spirit are and to see how often they appear together in verses. I could not believe time and time again how when one is talked about, another is mentioned and how those fruits of the Spirit in particular are useful in counseling other people, in helping believers, in helping others to come unto the knowledge of God. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3, it says, this is a true saying. I'll read from the King James first. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop or a leader in the body of Christ, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife, he can only have just one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. And I'm going to read verse 3 again to you in the ESV. It says, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. In order to be someone who leads or works for God, you, you have to be aware of these things. Be vigilant, be sober, you know, clear in your mind. Be of good behavior, give into hospitality. Be not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome. And quarrelsome, that's like picking fights with people. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you're a parent, you see it with your kids sometimes, they just mm -hmm. pick fights. But if you go on social media, I bet you also see people that are just quarrelsome. It's maybe a natural man instinct, mm -hmm. and yet, it is not something that God wants us to be. So not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome. So it's um, being gentle is a way to diffuse a situation and keep things peaceful with our approach. And it's a great way to have that in your mindset of um, how can I diffuse this situation? I can approach it with gentleness. Uh, you don't have to turn there, but in Proverbs 15, 1, it says, A soft or a gentle answer turns away wrath. Yeah. Mm -hmm. God knows what he's talking about. Yeah. God knows all people inside and out. So if you want to reach someone, if you want to get someone, um, do it God's way. And God says the best way to do it is with a gentle answer. It takes the maybe anger that they're right about to have, and it just quiets it. It just quiets it. Um, and we can do that when we keep things gentle. Uh, a gentle answer brings God's results in the situation. Uh, Henry Thayer, and you may recognize his name from the Thayer's Greek lexicon. He says that gentleness is the opposite to self-assertiveness and self-interest. It stems from trust in God's goodness and control over the situation. So being gentle, it's not serving your interests. It's not what you maybe want to be doing. It's not asserting yourself like, well, I'm right and I'm better. And I, I promise that if you trust me, you'll do better in this situation because I know. That's not what gentleness is. That's not God's way. It's trusting in God's way to handle a situation. We are speaking for and doing things for God that he asks us to do. And when we trust in him, we trust that God backs up his word 100% of the time. Um, and we're able to have that quiet confidence in God. We're able to be patient, loving, joyful about a situation. All of those fruits of the spirit. Because we trust that God will do his part and we don't have to do God's part. And just it's so freeing, no matter what the situation, to know that you don't have to do God's job. He's doing it, and he's doing it better than you can, I promise. Um, so God backs things up. And to get the point of cross that we're making for God, we're doing for God, we don't have to make a spectacle. And that is great, because maybe you do like to make a spectacle, but I don't. 
and to know that that's not what God asks of us to be successful for him, um, that's great. We can have quiet strength and be truly gentle. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. And again, this word meekness here is actually our word, protes, that gentleness. Verse 12, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Um, and I'll read you that verse 11 in the English Standard Version. It says, but as for you, O man of God, Flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. So there are these people who are worldly-minded people. And they have a love of money, which is the root of all evil. And they covet after, they, they really want and desire the things of the world, the things that the adversary has to offer, and not the things that God has to offer. And you know what they do when they chase after those things? They pierce their own hearts. They fill their own lives with sorrow. And we, we, brother and sister in Christ, we don't have to have those things. We can follow after all of the great things of God's word. We can follow or pursue, it says. And to pursue, it is like to chase after. You ever like see a guy in a movie who just falls in love with this girl and he pursues her, right? He goes after her with everything he's got. We are to pursue gentleness, pursue righteousness, pursue godliness, faith, love, steadfastness. Chase after it with all of your heart because you have to fight for it. It is not your first reaction in every situation to be gentle. It's not. But if you choose the world's way, you're piercing your own heart. You're filling your life with sorrow. And that's not what we want. But when we follow after the things of God, then we have joy we have peace we have love we have gentleness we have patience we have all of these fruits of the spirit so aggressively pursue chase after these things um, and when we are gentle we're fully aware we are knowledgeable yet we are making a choice to handle things with god's love and peace and tenderness and then again it's not our own agenda or emotions that win in a situation it's god and it's what he desires uh, you don't have to turn there. I'll read it to you. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 10, this is the King James. It says, Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. You see a mighty God. Again, gentleness is in no way tied to timid, weak, or pathetic. Okay? And here in verse 11, it says, He, God, shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. Our God, our mighty God, he is gentle, he is tender. And what a mental picture you get when you picture that shepherd gathering up the little lamb, the little young lamb to his bosom and how gentle and kind and tender and compassionate he is to that. That little lamb, we are like those little lambs. Turn to Titus chapter three. And this is the last um, scripture we'll go to looking at gentleness. Uh, Titus chapter three, we're gonna start in verse three, uh, but I'm going to read all of this to you in the NIV, the New International Version, which is also another great translation that just sometimes helps you see things in a sort of more clear way. So Titus 3.3, 3, remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, 
to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle toward everyone. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So remind the people, you know, to do these things which are good and right, to be obedient, to do whatever is good, um, to slander no one, to be peaceful. Peaceable. Remind the people to always be gentle toward everyone. Why? because we all fall short of the glory of God. We all at one time were foolish. We all at one time were disobedient. We hated or were hateful. We were enslaved by the things of the world, just like that person that maybe you're trying to get through to is. And when we remember when dealing with people that we too have been there, that unless you're Jesus Christ, you weren't perfect, well, it really helps you to be gentle with them. When you remember your form, then you can more lovingly deal with somebody. Um, we know where we came from. We know who we are without God. So you can be gentle in your dealings with people, just like it says here in Titus. In Romans, it talks about the goodness of God or the gentleness of God leading men to repentance. What brings someone out from what they're in and into the correct thing? It's the goodness of God. It's God and his goodness and his gentleness. And that is what we can show one another. Gentleness reaches people and it draws them in. It allows them to put aside their pride and truly make a heart change, which is what we want because you can change your actions for a moment, okay? But if it's not a heart change, then you're just doing it for appearances. And God, he's after the heart. Gentleness brings results. It leads rest, leads to rest in your own soul. It resolves conflicts. It's a way that we can be imitators of Jesus Christ in the way that he was gentle with people. It's the approach that we can have when we talk to someone or the way we can comfort someone and hold them close like the little lamb that the shepherd held close to him. Gentleness is our attitude, it's our approach, it's our words. And I want to read um, something that I found that blessed me, and I think it might bless you and illustrate the point a little bit. Uh, the word here, protis, right, from the fruit of the spirit, that means gentleness, is a word that was often used in Greek literature. And I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, so I'm going to read to you a time where it was used in Greek literature. The word protis was used to describe a wild horse that had been tamed, but whose spirit had never been broken. The horse was still lively, vigorous, and energetic, but under control and therefore useful. Mm. We can be like that. We aren't asking anyone to dull yourself down, to hold yourself back, to be subdued, to be gentle. You can be that wild horse who is vigorous and energetic, who is full of life and full of godliness, and yet you can be under control and therefore useful to God. Socrates said that a gentle person, that same word, is one who could argue his case without losing his temper. You can stand up for God's word. You can stand up for what's right. But again, you're doing it under control. So when you think of being gentle and having the fruit of the Spirit in your own life, think of these verses that we went to and the gentleness that you see in that way. And when God tells us to reprove someone or to stand up for him in a situation, um, we aren't that timid lady who walks up to a situation and goes, oh, please, mister, don't do that. You know, we are bold. We're speaking for God. And yet we have strength under control. Uh, it's a knowledgeable person who is obedient to God and is passionate about God's word and unwavering in their conviction, yet they are still kind and tender-hearted. 
So I just think that it's such a wonderful way to look at it and to remember when you deal with people, which if you're living in this world, you're going to be dealing with people. So remember that you have the fruit of the Spirit, that that's available to you, to me, to all of us, and that we can endeavor to just see it more in our lives. 